to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I am continuing a series that I started on Monday of this week talking about killing sacred cows. At title, it may throw some people off, but what I'm doing is using Mark chapter 7, verse 13, where Jesus said that you make the Word of God of none effect through your traditions and doctrines of men. And so I'm calling these religious teachings, these religious traditions, sacred cows that basically people have been afraid to touch because it's been so long and it's been so pervasive and they're so ingrained in people that people are just afraid to touch them. And yet, these religious teachings make the Word of God of none effect. And so we just need to kill them. And I am attacking some of these doctrines. I know that there may be some people think that I'm attacking them and I'm being mean to people. You know, it's really interesting sitting in this chair and getting the response that I do because every time I say something about I know that this could offend you and things like that, what I'm trying to do is trying to let people know that I care about them. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm saying this because I love them. It's a way of trying to uh, present the truth in love so that you, people don't feel like I'm attacking them. And every time I do that, I'll have people attack me and say, why are you apologizing? You need to speak the truth and quit apologizing for it. And then if I don't say something like that and try and show that I have compassion towards the people who I know are upset with me, and if I don't say anything, well, then I get criticism from the other side about, boy, you're just mean and vicious and on and on. And so, you know, well, I'm going to get criticized anyway you go. So I've just gotten where basically I say what I feel God wants me to and, and forget the criticism. But anyway, we've been talking, uh, yesterday I started talking about how that people through the Old Testament law got a wrong impression of the nature of God. Because in the Old Testament you see harshness and wrath and judgment. And sad to say, a lot of religious teaching today bases their representation of God, the way that they are representing God to the people, is based on the Old Testament model. And yet in Hebrews chapter 1, it says in verse 1 that God spake in different ways and different times by these different means through prophets, etc. But now in these last days, He spoke unto us by His Son, whom He's appointed heir of all things, who is the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person. And the point, if you continue to go on through uh, Hebrews chapter 1, is that Jesus, the revelation Jesus brought of God, is greater than the Old Testament revelation of God that came through angels. And then the rest of the book of Hebrews begins to start showing how that Jesus is a greater representation of God than Moses was, and how that the whole priesthood was changed. It used to be through the line of Aaron, now it's through... Melchizedek, and since the priesthood is changed, the whole covenant has to be changed. And then chapters 8, 9, and 10 are all about this new covenant, how all of our sins have been wiped out. We don't offer sacrifices anymore. And anyway, it's, there's abundant proof for anybody who's looking for it that there is a radical difference between the way Jesus represented God and the way that the Old Testament saints represented God. And it's not because God changed. Some people think God has a split personality and they wonder, is He the God of the Old Testament today or is He the God of the New Testament? Is He loving and kind and showing grace or is this a day that He's going to judge people? They wonder, is He in a good mood or in a bad mood? But, you know, I've got a teaching and I've just been barely touching on this and we're offering as a companion teaching to what I've been doing here on television a book and a series of teaching that I've got entitled The True Nature of God. And uh, that is powerful. This ought to be required teaching for every single person who's a Christian. And what it does is harmonizes the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And so today is going to be my last day. I just spent yesterday and today on this subject, and I'm just barely scratching the surface. You really need to get that full representation of this. But let me just use a few scriptures here out of Galatians chapter 3. And it's talking about Abraham and how that Abraham was justified in the sight of God not because he lived holy. Abraham did not live holy. 
He did in some ways, but he was willing to let kings take his wife and commit adultery with her just so that he could save his neck. And he didn't do it once, he did it twice. Abraham had some serious issues. He was not a godly man in some ways. And the scripture makes it very clear that it was his faith that made him justified, not his holiness and goodness. And then that leads into talking about that there was a covenant established with Abraham by faith, based on his faith. The reason Abraham had a relationship with God is because Abraham believed God. Genesis chapter 15 verse 6 says, Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. It was his faith that made him in right standing with God, not his performance. And God made a covenant with him in the 15th chapter and of Genesis and this covenant to Abraham was 430 years before the covenant of the law. And so Galatians is bringing this out to show that the first covenant is the superior covenant by virtue of the fact that it's the older covenant. That the second covenant was an add-on and it did not supersede or negate the first covenant. It was an add-on until Jesus could come and establish a totally brand new covenant separate from Abraham covenant or from the Old Testament law. So that's what Galatians chapter 3 is talking about. And I mean, it's just vicious in the way that Paul is saying this. Again, Paul dealt with these same issues in Romans, but in Romans it was kind of a scholarly approach and he was just discussing things and there's not this same emotion. But in Galatians, I mean, he is vicious. He is saying things. Look at just some of these verses. In verse 1, Galatians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, O foolish Galatians. You know, I think it's the New Jerusalem Bible that translates this, you stupid Galatians. And you know, I said this um, on some pr uh, program previously, and I had some people just write in that were mad and broken hearted that I would say the word stupid. They have taught their children that that is profanity and they never utter that word. And how dare I say this? You know what? I can't help how you use words, but I'm just saying that you can, you can be upset, but this is what Apostle Paul is saying. And to say foolish Galatians, and the word literally means stupid. That is what it means. And if this offends you, then the Bible offends you. I'm not trying to offend anybody, but I'm also just trying to say that, you know what, we do need to confront some things that some of the things we say and do are stupid. And these religious doctrines, these sacred cows, many of them are just absolutely stupid. They're foolish. It's foolish the way that Religion has taught that we have to be holy and do all of these things to earn the favor of God when the scriptures are so clear. Scriptures just like this one. It says, oh foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you? That's talking about that this is demonic. That you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth crucified among you. Paul is saying that he was so graphic in his depiction of Jesus bearing our sins and how he suffered and was brutalized. And he, he was so graphic in his words that it was like Jesus was crucified right in front of them. God touched them. They saw it. They saw Jesus die, not with their physical eyes, but with the eyes of their heart. And he says, how could you act this way? Because you saw this. At one time, this was reality to you. In verse 2, this only what I learn of you, received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith. Of course, the obvious answer to this is it was just faith that they received. They hadn't been living holy. When they first got born again, they hadn't been going to church and paying their tithes and studying the Bible and praying and fasting and doing all this stuff. No, they were rank sinners. These Galatians were pagan people. They weren't uh, religious Jews. They were just sinners. They were pagans. And they didn't have any holiness to their name. And yet when they heard Paul preaching the gospel, they believed and they received the Holy Spirit and healings and deliverance and all of the benefits of salvation just by faith in Jesus, not based on their good works. And then he goes on to say in verse 3, Are you so foolish? Again, the word literally means stupid. Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? A great point here. How did you get born again? 
I can guarantee you, you didn't get born again because you earned it. You didn't come to God saying, oh God, I've lived so holy, now you must save me. No, you came singing that song just as I am without one plea, and you put faith in Jesus. That's how you received. It was not based on any goodness of yours, but you put faith in a Savior. And are you so foolish that if that's the way you started your Christian life, now do you feel like you have to earn all of the blessings of God? See, that's inconsistent. Colossians chapter 2, verse 6 says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. That means if you got saved by putting faith in what Jesus did for you, not what you've been doing for Him, well, then that's the way you should continue to walk with the Lord. You ought to receive it as a free gift. And these are the points that he's making. In verse 4, he says, Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles among you. Doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Again, here's a question, and the obvious answer is, it's faith. It's not because he's holy. Now, some of you have never seen a miracle, but I have seen lots of miracles. I've seen my son raised from the dead. I've seen blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I've seen people come out of wheelchairs. I've seen a lot of miracles, and I can guarantee you I haven't seen that because I deserve it. I have never earned God's favor. God has never had anybody qualified working for Him yet, and I'm not going to be the first one, neither are you. you. If you are operating in the power of the Holy Spirit and seeing miracles, you're seeing it because you have faith in what Jesus did, not because you put faith in what you have done. So the obvious answer to this question is it was faith that produced all of these miracles. And then he uses verse 6, even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. That's going back to Genesis 15, 6, the scripture that I was talking about where God made this covenant with Abraham and promised him that his seed would be as the sand on the seashore or the stars in the sky for number. And it says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. In verse 7, it says, Know ye therefore, because of all of these things that he's been saying, because you didn't get started by your goodness, you haven't earned it, you can't perform a miracle based on how good you are. Look at Abraham, how did he get right standing with God? It was through faith, not through his goodness. Therefore, because of all of those things, they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen through faith, Preach before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all nations be blessed. Boy, this is a radical statement. God will justify the heathen, not the righteous, not the holy, not the churchgoers. These are talking about heathen, people that don't even believe, people who are nothing. But when they hear the truth, all they've got to do is believe, and boom, they get uh, born into the family of God and instantly have rights and standing without having to go through cemetery, I mean seminary, and earn it and do all of these kind of things. They just are born into the kingdom of God. In verse 9, So then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. That's the last verse of Deuteronomy chapter 27. And in Deuteronomy 27, it had the children of Israel divided into two parts, one stood on one mountain, uh, six of the tribes, half of the people stood on one mountain, the other six stood on another mountain, and one of them gave out all of the curses if you don't keep the law. The other one gave the blessings for keeping the law, and there was a lot more curses than there were blessings. And the, the last verse of that chapter, Deuteronomy 27, says, Cursed is he that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And all of the people said, Amen. And so the point that he's bringing out, haven't you read this? Haven't you understood that if you think that you have to earn God's favor, if you think that you have to be holy for God to answer your prayer, if you are basing God's movement in your life on your holiness, haven't you read what the law says that you're cursed if you don't obey all of it? It's not a matter of you doing 90% or 95%, do the best you can, and then God grades on a curve and will round you up. No, you either have to be perfect, or if you make 99.999, you fail. You get a zero. You go directly to hell. You do not pass go. You don't collect $200. You do not have a relationship with God. 
That's the point that he's trying to get across, and it's amazing how people miss this. The people who counter me because I teach on grace and say that God loves us, not because we're lovely, but because He is love, and that you can just believe on God and you don't have to earn the favor of God. Little parentheses right here, this does not mean I encourage sin. I believe that we should live holy, not in order to change God's heart towards us, but so that we could change our heart towards God. But people who criticize me because I preach on the grace of God, they conveniently don't read the scriptures about you have to observe to do all of these commands. And you know, I was just quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 27, and in, in the last verse of that, let me read the very next verse to you. This is Deuteronomy chapter 28, and you often will hear this preached on, but it says, and it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. And I've heard people take these verses and say, if you aren't experiencing these blessings, and then they'll talk about how you're blessed in your basket and blessed in your store, blessed going out, blessed coming in. You're the head and not the tail. You're above and not beneath. You're healthy. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And all, they go through all of these things. And they say, if you aren't experiencing that, it's because you haven't hearkened diligently. And so you got to try harder and try harder. But they are conveniently missing this truth. It says you have to observe to do according to all His commandments. All. Not some of them. All of them. And if you back up again to the last verse of Deuteronomy 27, it says, Cursed be he that confirmeth not all of the words of the law to do them, and all the people shall say, Amen. You have to do all of them. It's not do the best you can, and, and if it's above 70%, you're accepted. Unless you are perfect, is what the law is saying, then the curse comes on you instead of the blessing. And people just conveniently forget this. Like, like the Scripture is saying right here in Galatians chapter 3, it says, um, Don't you hear what the law says? In verse 10, it says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God. It is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And then look at this verse in verse 12. It says, And the law is not of faith. Now that is one strong statement. And Romans 14, 23 says, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. The law is not of faith. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Can you connect those dots? And <laughs> can you see that if you are trying to live by the Old Testament law, it's sin for a New Testament believer? And I know that there's just people all over the world that are just shocked, like, how could you say this? Well, I'm trying to kill a sacred cow because the religious teaching of the day is that, oh, no, you still have to keep all of the law. You still got to approach God. God is going to judge you. But in the New Testament, God has brought in a new covenant. And this is what it's saying. The law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith, not through works, not through effort, not because we deserve it. And he just keeps saying the same thing over and over. You know, for time's sake, I've got to skip some of these verses, but look down into verse 21. It says, Is the law then against the promises of God? You know, the answer to this is in the next phrase, God forbid, which in the original language is about as close as you can get to using profanity, <laughs> amen. It is an absolute unqualified no. He is an absolute denial of this, but let me point this out, that if you don't ever have the question, well, is the Old Testament law then against the New Testament? If you don't have that question, then you haven't heard the same gospel that Paul preached because he not only said it here, he said it twice in Romans chapter 6, and he said it another time here in the book of Galatians. There's four different times Paul brought the same thing up. 
So if you preach the gospel, the same gospel that the Apostle Paul preached, this question is going to come up. Is the Old Testament law then against the promise of God? And the answer is, God forbid. No, that's not what he's saying. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. But the Scripture hath concluded all under sin that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, this is talking about Jesus, the New Testament that we live under, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster, for we are all children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm just about out of time, but basically this is saying that the law had a purpose. And if you use the law for the purpose that it was given for, which is to show you your sin and to take away any hope of self-salvation, self-righteousness, if you use the law to condemn people and to show them their need for God, then the law is good. But if you use the law to try and have a relationship with God, it's impossible. The law cannot give you relationship with God. A system of do's and don'ts, and you do this and this and this, and God will do that. God didn't give that so that you could really earn the things of God. It was to show you that God's standard was so far beyond your ability to ever fulfill it that it would make you throw yourself on God for mercy. It's like it says here, it was given to shut us up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Because here was the law telling you to do everything. So you made a New Year's commitment. I'm going to do this. And you tried, but the law was there showing you you was wrong. So then you head in this direction, and there's the law condemning you. Then you head in this direction, and the law condemns you. And you head in this direction, and the law condemns you. And it just shuts you up so that you couldn't earn it. You can't do it. You can't live up to the law. And it made you look up and say, oh, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. If you use the law for that purpose, then it's good. But see, it was never given to produce relationship with God. That can only come by putting faith in what Jesus did for you. And so a lack of understanding the, this harmony between the Old Covenant law and the New Testament grace has caused many people to come up with a view of God that is harsh and judgmental, taken from the Old Testament with a complete disregard for the New Testament teaching, and it has become a sacred cow, a religious doctrine that stops the power of God from working in people's life. It stops their relationship because they don't feel worthy. Boy, these are powerful, powerful truths. You know, I've got more to share, but we are going to end this teaching on the second teaching in my new series on killing sacred cows. Listen to our announcer as he gives you some information about this and call or write today. Andrew's complete teaching titled Killing Sacred Cows was recorded live at a recent Gospel Truth seminar. It's available on either CD or DVD for 16 pounds. Request item T1063C for the CD, T3207D for the live DVD, or you can get a DVD as seen on TV for seven pounds. Request item T1063D for the as seen on TV DVD when you contact us. This series is also available for audio download absolutely free on our website. Go to awme.net and click on MP3 downloads on the left-hand side of the page. The second teaching in the Killing Sacred Cows series titled Split Personality is available on CD for three pounds. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will send this second CD free of charge when you write or call. On today's program, Andrew mentioned his teaching titled The True Nature of God. This product is available on CD for 16 pounds. Request CD album T1002C. Let me remind you that today is my last day to offer you the second teaching in this new five-part series that I've entitled Killing Sacred Cows. Now we're offering the CD, the DVD, the live uh, program that we recorded at our Gospel Truth, and we're asking for a donation of some amount for those materials. But some people would not 
or could not send any money in, and so we make each individual CD in this album available to you as a gift. My partners have enabled me to do that. If you want this free teaching on split personality, you need to call or write today. To write us, use the address on your screen. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922-473-300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. If the lines are busy, you can visit our website at awme.net. We hope to hear from you today. We'd also like to remind you that Andrew's latest book titled Living in the Balance of Grace and Faith is available in hardback for £12.50. Request book T228. There was a time in my life, and we'll start with, I went to church and that. But after I had my second son, I was getting into teaching in Ireland of sanctification and things like that. And I had a very bad time of that. And I was afraid of God. I was afraid of God. I was afraid to touch the Bible or go to church. I used to always shrink when I went into church for a wedding or a christening. I was so afraid of God. I thought he was really out to get me. But my son had got me, he was in the army at the time, he brought me a beautiful Bible. But I never opened it. I, I never opened it, it was just an ornament like, you know. I felt safe with it. Don't know why, but I felt safe with the Bible. And then whenever I heard Andrew talking like, that sort of opened all the Word of God to me. The first time I heard Andrew, my husband had just died, which is 24 years next month. And somebody had got hold of some of Andrew's chair, so, so tapes, before he came to England. And it was how to know God's will for your life. And if we were to tell people that the point of salvation isn't just getting your sins forgiven, but it's having intimacy, that God Almighty loves you, he is so passionate about you that God Almighty wants to spend time with you. He wants to be your best friend. And I started listening. And you couldn't believe what you are hearing, could you? You know, it was amazing. Amazing to know you were healed. To know you had a God that loved you, not that, you know, um, not done that was judging you. Some people still think that, that they're under the wrath of God, and he put that all in Jesus, didn't he? He's love, isn't he? And, he? and he just loves us so much. I'm 84 years old now, and as I learn to live by that word, and not just hear it, but to do what the word said, um, it changed my life. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for more Gospel Truth.